Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to Swayam Prabha. This is Dr. Sumiti Ahuja and I am Assistant Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. In the 10th, that is the last session in Law of Contracts, we will be discussing about a very important topic that is quasi-contracts. On your screens, you can see the various topics, the subtopics which we have to take up in our last session on quasi-contracts. We will be starting with discussion on the meaning of quasi-contracts. Thereafter, we will proceed with the discussion on the, the rationale or the very basis uh, of the concept of quasi-contracts that is theory of unjust enrichment. Then we will be discussing the relevant provisions related to quasi-contract under the Indian Contract Act 1872 that is section 68 to section 72. This will be followed by two more topics. Uh, one is remedies pertaining to quasi-contracts. In our last session, we had discussed about the remedies in case of breach of contract. Herein, we would be seeing as to what are the remedies in case of quasi-contracts. The last topic which we have to take up is the difference between a contract as defined under section 10 of the Indian Contract Act and quasi-contract. It's, it's very interesting to see that although section 68 to 72 of the Indian Contract Act are dealing with the concept of quasi-contracts, but nowhere in the entire Indian Contract Act has this term been used or defined. But the principles which have been incorporated in all these sections, that is 68 to 72, they are based or they are resembling those re uh, relations which are created by or created under a contract. How we will be proceeding to that, we will be discussing that one by one. But let us first start with the uh, understanding as to what do we mean by the term quasi. In one of our previous sessions, I had told you this thing that most of the times, the meaning is hidden in the legal terminology itself. So, we know what is a contract, but what do we mean by a quasi-contract? Quasi-contract is, which is almost a contract, but it is still not a complete valid contract and that is why it is quasi, right. So, certain relations resembling those created by contract. Now, the provisions relating to quasi-contract under the uh, Indian Contract Act, they are headed as, this is the heading given to the, uh, that chapter dealing with quasi-contracts because I was just telling you that this term has not been defined anywhere in the Act. Nowhere has it been used in these uh, provisions uh, under 68 to 72, but the heading which is mentioned there uh, in that group of sections is that those provisions or those instances, if I may say, which have been highlighted under 68 to 72, they resemble those relations which are created by contract. That is why quasi, they resemble relations created by a contract, but still they are not valid contract, reason being that in order to be a valid contract, the act provides for certain essentials as defined or as stated if I may say, they have been defined under different provisions, but as they have been stated under uh, section 10 of the Indian Contract Act. Then, many a times law as well as justice demands that certain individual or, a, or certain person be required to confirm, that is to obey an obligation even though he has not broken any contract nor has committed tort. What do we mean by this? 
we mean that see the relations which we are referring to under 68 to 72 that is what we are terming as quasi contracts they are neither they do not it's not like that a person is breaking some kind of a contract nor is it like a tort has been committed why it why can't we say that a person has not broken a contract because no breach has taken place because when we say broken a contract for that there is a requirement of a contract first herein no contract and for that matter no agreement even is in existence because for a contract first there should be an agreement in existence and as we had discussed in our previous sessions agreement is offer plus acceptance so here neither an offer is being made nor is that offer being accepted right and why can't we say a tort is committed so one aspect in which uh, contracts and quasi contracts they have resemblance or the a point of similarity you can say is that in case of quasi contract also we are referring to relations between two parties so when one person's action has affected the interest of the other party right whereas in case of torts it's not like there are two parties basically it's like you have a duty towards uh, others duty towards public at large that you are not going to infringe or not going to injure anybody's legal right liability of this kind liability we mean the liability in relation to a quasi contract so liability of this kind is hard to classify it is hard to classify because it is neither completely fulfilling the requirements of a valid contract nor is it completely fulfilling the requirements of a tort that's why it becomes hard to classify it partly it resembles liability under law of tort in as much as it arises independently of any contract see be it contract be it a tort for that matter be it a quasi contract they are all falling under the category of a civil wrong that's why this statement here wherein we are seeing saying that partly it resembles liability under law of tort in as much as it arises independently of any contract and the remaining part resembles contract in as much as liability is owed only to one party and not to persons generally this is the point of difference between a contract as well as a tort also and similar is the situation in relation to a quasi contract and torts that liability in case of a quasi contract is owed only to one party whereas in case of a uh, tort it is owed to public at large that is persons in general therefore it can be accounted for either under an implied contract that is although it is not fulfilling the conditions but still an implied contract or under natural justice and equity for prevention of unjust enrichment in our next uh, slide we would be proceeding to the discussion in relation to the theory of unjust enrichment but for the time being just understand this thing that yes there have been two types of uh, theories or if i may say two types of uh, uh, justification about the existence of or about the rationale of uh, quasi contract one of them has been that it, it it is an implied contract yes it is not a complete contract not fulfilling all the essentials of a valid contract but it's considered like an implied contract and on the other hand then the other theory which uh, uh, which was uh, dealing with the rationale of uh, quasi contracts was theory of unjust enrichment that is you are getting benefited with something to which you are not entitled to right so as you can see on your screens the last statement i have written that although preferred rationale is prevention of unjust enrichment so whenever you will be studying about the concept of quasi contracts and you will be studying about the basis the rational or the purpose behind the origin of this concept quasi contract and its incorporation within our uh, statutory law it is said to be theory of unjust enrichment again what do we mean by unjust unjust means it's unreasonable 
you are not entitled to it but still you have received some kind of benefit enrichment is a benefit which you have received it says rationale behind provisions related to quasi contract we are talking about unjust enrichment here and it is based on the idea of equity and justice that is justice should be uh, done in this case because one person is being unnecessarily harmed is is uh, uh, losing something and the other person without doing anything is gaining something out of it so the person who is unnecessarily losing something which he is not supposed to and the other party gaining at this person's cost there is equity and justice principle says that good should be done to both and good should be done specially to that person who is unnecessarily being affected because of the act of another person as you can see it means enrichment of one at the cost of another we are not just sticking to the part that see one party is getting benefited fine one party is getting benefited that's okay but this one party in case of quasi contracts is getting benefited by causing harm to the interest of the other person be it deliberately be it anyhow but harm is being caused to the interest of other person an innocent person in other words unjust enrichment occurs when someone benefits as i just told you unfairly unreasonably due to circumstances or other parties misfortune which means the act cannot be act need not necessarily be deliberate but something of that sort has happened that the situation is one person has gained and the other person's right has been uh, interest has been affected no person should take so basically this concept of uh, quasi contract uh, the the rationale behind quasi contract we just uh, referred to that is unjust enrichment it it was amongst one of the main principles of roman law that is no person should take advantage of the position of another person which causes some loss to one party and gain to another party now see that is what in 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 case of contracts we generally say that uh, two parties enter into a contract and be it that one part it it may be the case that one party is gaining more out of it the other party is gaining less but still we we say this thing that uh, the purpose of contract is that both the parties get something out of that relation or the contractual obligations which they have decided to abide by now in case of quasi contract the parties have not entered into any actual contract be it oral or be it in written form right but still it says that uh, still one person cannot be uh, allowed if i may say to take uh, advantage of other person's situation and cause harm to that person and end up causing good for himself so that was amongst one of the most important principles of roman law that is no human being should should be allowed to take advantage of the unnecessary advantage of the position of another human being it gives an impression of a contract which neither party intended to enter into but the law imposed it that is what we have to understand why we say that it is a quasi contract and not a complete contract it is not a complete contract because it is not fulfilling the requirements and it is not something not uh, it's not an obligation which the parties have decided to enter into intentionally right but instead the law has imposed it courtesy the situation which has been led to because of act of one person it's a fictional contract it's very interesting that some authors have referred to it as a fictional contract which has been acknowledged by court fictional because it is not for real acknowledged by court reason being that see what is the purpose of law purpose of law uh, the law which we read the rules which are formed is to protect interest of a person now if we know 
that the situation is such we will be going through section 68 to 72 and we will understand what situations are we referring to. But see uh, fictional contract acknowledged by a court because the court can see that a person's legal right or a person's interest is being hampered without any fault of that person. So, the purpose of the, the duty of the court is to grant relief to a person who claims, who goes to the court, who enforces his right and claims that his or her legal right has been infringed or has been interrupted by the act of another person. We will start with these provisions one by one, section 68 to 72. If you, if I just help you all in refreshing your memories, when we were discussing uh, in, in the module of or in the session related to capacity to contract, when we had discussed about Mohri Bibi versus Dharmadas Ghosh, so if I may quickly take you back briefly to the facts of that case. Because that was the first time we came across this provision of section 68 during our sessions. Because in that case, the defendant who was the money lender had tried to claim remedy from the court under section 68 of the Indian Contract Act, but it was denied. So, facts basically were these that uh, a minor, a child, he had uh, who, who had not atta attained the age of majority, he was a minor. He misrepresented his age and got up, got uh, his property mortgaged and uh, in, in return of it, he had uh, received advance payment of the mortgaged the amount, right? He had received half payment of it, uh, not half exactly, but uh, some advance from it. Now, later on when it came to his transferring his rights over the property to the money lender who had uh, uh, lended him money. He approached the court in order to get the instrument cancelled. Instrument that is the mortgage deed which had been signed, which had been entered into, that agreement which had been entered into between the money lender and the minor. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that in this case, the money lender was had authorized one of his attorneys to take care of all his business transactions therein. So, that attorney uh, got an intimation from the mother of this minor only that this person was a minor and therefore, the, uh, the attorney or the money lender for that matter should act cautiously and should not enter into such kind of transaction and if they will do that, it will be at their own risk, right. Now, despite this intimation, the attorney uh, got the minor to sign a declaration and in that declaration, it was written that the, the, the minor, minor was Dharmadas Ghosh. So, Dharmadas Ghosh was uh, giving a declaration there. So, wherein he was uh, uh, affirming that he had, he was, he had come of age or he was a major and therefore, he could rightfully enter into a valid contract. But when he approached the court, when Dharmadas Ghosh approached the court, he claimed uh, he basically claimed he took the defense of uh, minority and uh, and uh, said that this document which had been entered into between the two parties that is minor and the money lender it should be uh, cancelled right now the court allowed that to be done because uh, there is no estoppel against a minor now what happened further was that uh, then the defendant that is the money lender he said that fine if the court is willing to give remedy to the minor, then in that case, the court should allow repayment of the advance money to the money lender, right? That is the minor should be made to return the money which he had borrowed from the money lender back to the money lender. Now, on that point, the defendant tried to take help of many legal provisions. Yes. Uh, he could have got uh, a relief under specific relief act, but uh, due to certain reasons uh, imputed to the knowledge of uh, the money lender that he was aware about the minority of uh, the child, but still entered into a contract with him. So, could not get any relief, but otherwise section number 68 
of the Indian Contract Act was also one of the provisions under which the, the defendant that is the money lender tried to claim remedy. Now, let us see I, I have given you the background of the case and let us see what 68 provides for and why did what was the reason that the court did not uh, did, did not uh, give uh, any remedy to the defendant under section 68. 68 basically deals with what we call as claim for necessaries. It says claim for necessaries supplied to a person who is incapable of contracting or on his account. So, here uh, why is it falling under quasi contract and why is it not a complete contract reason is that party one of the parties is incompetent. So, a valid contract can never be entered into. So, it says if a person who is incapable of entering into a contract or anyone whom he is legally bound to support. So, it is either a person who is incapable of entering into a contract or any person anyone whom this incapable person is legally bound to support is supplied by another person with necessaries suited to his condition in life. The person who has furnished such supplies is entitled to be reimbursed from the property of such incapable person. Now, one very interesting fact is that when you will go through all these provisions from 68 to 72, you will see you will realize that somewhere the term reimbursed has been used, somewhere the term liability is there, somewhere the term uh, say obligation is there. So, different terminologies have been used. So, it says that if someone has provided either a minor or a person of unsound mind or any person whom this minor or the person of unsound mind is supposed to be legally responsible to or is supposed to legally take care of them. They are provided with necessaries which are suited to their condition in life. The law says that the person who is providing such uh, necessaries can claim reimbursement, but from where can this reimbursement be uh, claimed? Can that person go to the court and say that I had given him, I had done this, this, this thing for him. So, ask me to return, uh, return all those things or return uh, money to me. This is the total which I have spent on him. Ask this person to return this much amount to me. The answer is no. The law is granting you a remedy, but that remedy as you can see on your screens is reimbursement from the property of such incapable person. So, if that incapable person does not have any property, this reimbursement would not be possible, right? Because if, if the court is allowed to enforce such a claim that yes, you have spent this much money upon uh, either a minor or his family or say uh, the, a, a person of unsound mind, fine, this is the total which you have to be given, right? Now, that would amount to enforcing something which is not a valid contract, right? Now, what is the meaning of necessaries? You can see on the screens that it says necessaries suited to his condition in life. So, it is a question of fact. You cannot actually define what is a necessity, what necessaries are. So, what are necessaries will differ from fact to fact or from case to case and depending on that, one would be able to see or decide as to in one situation whatever things were provided to the incompetent persons or their uh, relations were the necessaries which were which were basically necessities for them to live their life normally right so it it may be why i am saying question of fact because it is a relative term a thing may be a necessity for me but a luxury for another person or it may be a luxury for me, but a necessity for someone else. So, it differs. One of the examples uh, uh, if I may highlight for you, uh, illustrations from section 68, it states 
A supplies the wife and children of B a lunatic with necessaries suitable to their condition in life. A is entitled to be reimbursed from B's property. Right. Now, moving back to Mori B's judgment, now I hope you have understood why did the court not apply section 68 and granted the remedy to uh, money lender or the defendant there because it would have amounted to enforcement of an otherwise uh, invalid, uh, otherwise non-existent invalid contract and secondly, in fact, more importantly, there were most importantly rather, in this, uh, in Mori Bibi's case, the money lender did not provide any necessaries to the minor which was suited to his condition in life because the minor was trying to mortgage his property and in return of that he was borrowing money from the money lender. So, no necessaries have been provided as such. Moving on to the second provision that is uh, section 69 of uh, the Indian Contract Act 1872. Section 69 deals with reimbursement of person paying money due by another so, you are here also the term reimbursement has been mentioned like section 68, but reimbursement of whom? Therein it was reimbursement of a person who has provided minor or other competent, incompetent person to uh, uh, with necessary suited to his or her condition in life. Here we are talking about reimbursement of a person who has paid money which someone else was legally bound to pay. But because this person's interest was also involved, he has paid that money instead of the person who was legally bound to do that. Let us see what the provision has to say. A person who is interested. So, I am not just doing that act to help someone, right? My own interest is at stake and a person, it says a person who is interested in the payment of money which another is bound by law to pay and who therefore pays it is entitled to be reimbursed by the other. Now, one of the examples is or uh, the illustration which is attached to section 69 is if I may just uh, give it to you in a very brief manner. So, this person is owner of uh, many landed area, many land uh, much uh, big landed property and what he has done, he has given a particular property of his, immovable property, land of his to another person on lease, right. But what has happened, this person who is the owner of these properties, he has, uh, he is running into arrears in the sense that he has not paid his taxes. So, he is running in arrears of revenue, he has not paid the taxes which he was supposed to pay to the government. Now, Consider for example, now there is a government, uh, there is a law uh, for example which says that in such kind of a situation if a person runs into areas of revenue and is not ready to uh, pay that amount, then in such a situation government has the right to dispose of the property of such property of that person and get that particular money which that person was owing to the government. Now, in this case, if we see the essentials of uh, this provision, it says a person who is interested in the payment of money. So, yes, person who, who is on lease, who has who is on lease uh, of that property, who has taken lease from the owner of that property itself, uh, uh, for which the owner is running into arrears of revenue for which he has not paid taxes. Imagine if that if the government exercises that law, the right under that law and disposes of the property, then in such a situation, the person who, who, who was on lease, he would be losing his lease. He will be thrown, I mean not thrown out exactly, but uh, by default he will have to vacate, right. So, his interest is at stake, he will lose his lease. Now, what he does, instead of the owner paying those arrears of revenue to the government, the person who had taken that property on lease pays that amount to the government, so that the government does not sell off this particular property. 
now 69 says that if that person is doing that pay, making that payment on your behalf now you the owner of the property you will have to reimburse this person who paid the money instead of you and uh, you were actually legally bound to pay that money because they were taxes right general purport of section is or the general essence if i may say of the section is to afford to a person who pays money in furtherance of some existing interest and indemnity in respect of the payment against any other person who could have been made liable in law to make payment so yes in the example which we just discussed the owner of the land could have been made liable in law to make that payment because his property would have been sold off and the government could have uh, uh, government could have received that money the taxes which he had not paid right so in this case the uh, the general essence of the section is this only that is a person who is paying money in furtherance of some existing interest he should be returned that money back by that person who could have been made liable in law to make that payment now if we summarize the essentials of uh, section 69 we can see in the last point on the screen the payer that is the person who is making that payment whose interest is involved so payer must be interested in making payment or if i may say his interest is at stake therefore he is making that payment then he should not be bound to pay i am paying because my interest is also st at stake my interest will be affected because of your wrong deed and it says he should not be bound to pay but i am not bound to pay that money i have taken that property on lease from you and i am paying you the rent but i am not under any obligation to pay any kind of taxes to the government because that is your property i am only i have only uh, uh, taken that property on lease third is defendant should be under legal compulsion to pay yes the defendant now in this case the owner of the property was under legal compul compulsion to pay that amount because he had to pay taxes to the government uh, for that property but he did not uh, make that payment right payment should be one by one to another now the next provision we have to take up under quasi contracts is section 70 of the indian contract act which deals with obligation of person enjoying benefit of a non gratuitous act what do we mean by a non gratuitous act or for that matter gratuitous act when we say gratuitous act we mean that say for example i am just trying to help another person without expecting anything in return so acting in a gratuitous manner means you do something for someone without expecting anything in return but here in contrast to a gratuitous act we are referring to a non gratuitous act so obligation of a person who is enjoying benefit of non gratuitous act so it says where a person lawfully does anything for another person or delivers anything to him so does anything for another person or is delivering anything to him not intending to do so gratuitously so if i have done if i have done a lawful act lawfully if i have done something for another person or i have delivered something to that person right and my intention is not at all to act in a gratuitous manner or to do something for that person or deliver something to that person and just forget about it that is not my intention and such other person such other person for whom that act was done whose uh, uh, the acts benefit with uh, the person is uh, availing or the person to whom certain goods were delivered and that person has taken benefit of those goods then in that case such person who is enjoying the benefit thereof is bound to make compensation now in section 60 the terminology used was reimbursement right because you are returning what you have got you are returning it that's why reimbursement here we are talking about compensation 
right because it says you have enjoyed the benefit of that property it's not that you had taken care of it and now you are returning it back you have benefited out of that property so that's why now you will have to compensate the other person to make compensation to the former that is who delivered the goods or who did something for you in respect of or to restore the thing so done or delivered so it is talking about two things compensation say compensation if you have used that thing if you have consumed it or if you have already availed benefit of it right then you have to compensate the other person who had uh, uh, unintentionally done that act for you unintentionally uh, committed that act for you next is talking about restoration so section 70 is using two terms compensate or restore so if you have a thing if you have those uh, th that those goods available in your possession something which was delivered to you if it is still available with you you can restore it back to the person to whom that thing belongs right because if you have it in your possession and you have not done anything as such with it or even if you have used it it is still in a position that it can be returned back so please you are supposed to under section 70 restore thing that restore that thing back to that person or if you have consumed it finished it it can not be returned or it is not traceable in your possession anymore you have already benefited out of it then in that situation you will have to suitably compensate the other party now there is this judgment of state of west bengal versus bk mondal and sons it's a 1962 supreme court judgment where the supreme court has identified certain essentials of uh, section 70 first is person should lawfully do something for another person see again and again the emphasis is you have you should have done something lawfully some lawful act for another person should lawfully do something for another person or deliver something to him in doing the said thing or delivering the said thing he must not intend to act gratuitously and the other person for whom something is done or to whom something is delivered must have enjoyed the benefit thereof so first essential is that something has been done or some uh, thing has been delivered second thing is that such act of doing something or delivering something is a non gratuitous act the third requirement is that the uh, result of that non non gratuitous act or the result of doing something for someone or uh, uh, delivering something to someone is that the other person to for whom that act was done or to whom the things were delivered has benefited out of the non gratuitous act so that is required now in bk mondal and sons case this thing had happened because uh, bk mondal and sons this company they had uh, made an offer to the uh, government and that offer had been accepted and they had built certain temporary godowns in the hugli district uh, in calcutta they uh, in in uh, west bengal they had uh, made this uh, temporary godowns right this company so once that was made he uh, he prepared a bill and he submitted the bill the bill, the payment was made to him and uh, but according to him further what happened because of which he had to come to the court was that he says he was asked by one of the officers of the civil supplies department for for whom he had created those temporary go downs and other uh, things other structures so he says that after this twice further twice one of the officers of that department asked me to do certain other works for uh, the department and he did those works but when he has presented the bills the two bills were unpaid and that is the reason he had to approach the court because the government of the, the government was of the view that there was no valid contract which had been entered into for the latter two uh, uh, the latter two constructions there was no contract which had been entered into between bk mondal and sons and the government the civil supplies department basically the government uh, state of west bengal therefore he cannot claim that uh, recovery of that money he cannot do that 
Now then he took the uh, took the help of section 70 of the Indian Contract Act that he that B K Mondal and Sons being a construction company, if is doing some kind of construction that is not intended to be a gratuitous act, if it has been done and he was clear in his mind. Uh, the the person representing BK Mondal and Sons was very clear in the mind that the company was asked by this uh, government officer to do these constructions and if it has been done and mind you when these constructions were done the latter two constructions have been done they have been used they have been benefited they have been taken benefit of by the government. So, further then the court held that you did not object to it. If you actually are saying that there was no valid contract and therefore, uh, you are not under any obligation to uh, make payment for it, then at that time itself when those structures were constructed, you should have asked the company to uh, uh, destroy those structures or to break those structures because there was no contract and you did not want those structures. But here in the situation was that the structures were built and they were used they were uh, taken benefit of by the government. So, then the court said that fine agreed even if there was no valid contract, but section 70 which is a quasi contract makes you uh, I mean it, it is uh, putting you under an obligation you can see the opening words of the section 70 obligation of person. So, it is putting you under an obligation why because all the three essentials are being met person should lawfully do something yes it was a construction company who had lawfully constructed structure for the government then in doing the said thing he must not act he must not intend to act gratuitously there was no evidence in ex in existence which could show that the company by constructing those structures was acting in a, a gratuitous manner that is not expecting anything in return thirdly uh, other person for whom something is done uh, is uh, uh, have enjoyed the benefit thereof. So, yes in this case also the government did enjoy the benefit of uh, the construction which was done. So, the court took a decision in favor of B K Mondal and Sons. Moving to the next provision that is section 71 of the Indian Contract Act which talks about responsibility of finder of goods. There is a very common saying in law that is finder keeper, finder keeper that is he who finds something which act which initially originally does not belong to him. So, if he has found something he can keep that thing with him right. So, if you have found some goods which do not belong to you or uh, and which you do not know to whom it belongs finder can keep it, but there are certain prerequisites. What are those? Let us see. Responsibility of finder of goods. A person who finds goods belonging to another and takes them into his custody is subject to the same responsibility as a bailey, right. That is you can say as a custodian. A thing does not belong to you you have found it from somewhere, you have taken it into in your custody. Now, the law says now you have a duty and that duty is equivalent to that of a bailey that is custodian of that property. Now, what you have to do is you have to make effort to find out the true owner of that property if it is possible. If you do not make any effort and consume that thing. Uh, you can be made liable by the court of the law and uh, you can be asked to compensate right. But first of all first thing you have to do is you have to try and find out the true owner because again in law it is said that possession is 9 tenth of ownership that is owner has 10 if, if owner has 10 rights in relation to property the person who actually is possessing that property but is not the true owner has 9 rights that is one right less right. So, finder may have best type may I won't say best title uh, finder may have a better title on that property against anyone else, but 
except for the original the true owner of that property right so when we say the same responsibility as a bailey let's see what those what what are the responsibilities of bailey so basically section 5 uh, 151 and 152 of the indian contract act uh, lay down or basically state if i may say the responsibility of a bailey or the custodian of a property in all cases of bailment the bailey is bound to take as much care of the goods bailed to him as a man of ordinary prudence would under similar circumstances take of his own goods of the same bulk that is same quantity quality and value right so if you have uh, if something has been entrusted to you something has been given to you you have to take care or something is in your custody you have to take care of that property in a similar manner as if it was your own property uh, or if i may just rephrase it if uh, you have to take care of that property in the same manner as you would have taken care of your own property not that it is this is your property but uh, you uh, you would have taken care of your own property of same quantity same quality and same value right so basically 151 is talking about reasonable care 152 talks about the bailey in the absence of any special contract is not responsible for the loss destruction or deterioration of the thing bailed so if uh, if you have found something and say even if you are waiting for uh, you are trying to find out the true owner so if something happens to uh, the goods which you have found they get destroyed perish away or something happens to it you cannot be held liable you being the bailey the custodian of that property the finder of the property here you cannot be held liable for any kind of loss or destruction which could have happened to that property right if provided you have taken equivalent care of that property as mentioned under section 151 now let's move on to the last provision under uh, quasi contracts that is section 72 section 72 of the indian contract act talks about liability of a person to whom money is paid or thing delivered by mistake or under coercion the two things mentioned are mistake or coercion so if money has been paid to you or something has been delivered to you as a result of some mistake or coercion then in that case you have a liability which you owe to that person what is that liability let's see a person to whom money has been paid or anything delivered by mistake or under coercion must repay or return it so if money has been paid it has to be repaid if thing has been delivered it has to be returned right now many a times you will see that the language of the law is that you have to uh, i mean the the sentences are too long so you have to read it very carefully to be able to make some meaning out of it right so money is to be paid money that the correct terminology to be used is in uh, in relation to money repay and in relation to something delivered return right because uh, a thing which has been delivered it cannot be repaid it can only be delivered uh, uh, returned now one uh, instance here let's see payment by mistake in section 72 refers to a payment which was not legally due it was not legally due and which could not have been enforced right so payment by mistake if i am mistakenly given extra amount to a person whom i uh, was supposed to give a particular amount of money if under mistake i have given more uh, money to that person so this uh, point says here that uh, it was not legally due i was supposed to pay him a particular amount of money but mistakenly i have given additional amount 
and which could not have been enforced the mistake is in relation to thinking that the money paid was due when in fact it was not due uh, there is a slight difference now here so in order to understand this last point which has been written here that is the mistake is in relation to thinking that the money paid was due when in fact it was not due so let's just slightly modify the example which i had given you wherein i said that you you were supposed to give a particular amount of money to a person but instead you ended up giving additional amount to that person under mistake now what do we mean by uh, this thing here that you are thinking that a particular amount of money is due on you which you have to pay that person you think it is a particular amount of money but and you give that money to that person uh, under a mistaken impression but in reality a lesser amount was due right so he is supposed to that person is under an obligation who and is supposed to return that additional amount to you you thought that you have given the right amount of payment but it is not actually true and you were supposed to give a lesser amount so it is the duty on the part of that person to return that amount back to you so there is an illustration on your screens which is which has been uh, taken from uh, section 72 let's see what it says a and b jointly o 100 rupees to c a alone pays the amount to c now a and b they jointly o 100 rupees to c a alone out of his own free will he has uh, paid that 100 rupees to c and b is not aware of this and b also not knowing about the fact that a has already paid c again pays 100 rupees to c now b is not aware of that so it is the duty the liability of that person uh, to whom that money has gone twice to repay and re uh, return that um, uh, amount of money back to b who uh, in ignorance of the fact that a has already paid has again uh, paid that amount so it is the liability on part of the c because he is not entitled to that additional 100 rupees so he has to return that money back to b one uh, one more illustration we can uh, see uh, under section 72 that is a railway company refuses to deliver certain goods to the consignee except upon the payment of an illegal charge for carriage so section 72 is not restricted to mistake it is also making a reference to coercion so the previous example illustration which we discussed was pertaining to mistake this uh, illustration here is pertaining to what we call as coercion so railway company is refusing to deliver goods to a consignee except upon the payment of an illegal charge of carriage consignee does not have an option at that time consignee pays the sum because his property has been unlawfully detained and he does not have any option but to pay that additional charge so the consignee pays the sum charged in order to obtain the goods he is entitled to recover so much of the charge as was illegally excessive right so these two illu illustrations were in relation to section 72 let's move on towards the last uh, two uh, points which we have to discuss in relation to quasi contracts first is difference between contract and quasi contract so we have already discussed about the uh, what is a quasi contract what is the rationale behind a quasi contract that is theory of unjust enrichment we have also gone through various provisions pertaining to quasi contract that is from section 68 to 72 now before concluding let's see what is the difference between contract and quasi contract after which we'll be going through the remedy uh, available in case of quasi contract quasi contract is not a contract at all because the essential factors for the formation of contract are absent of uh, acceptance consideration capacity to contract free consent all these things all these uh, components or all these things which are essentials of a valid contract they are missing in case of a quasi contract right 
it is a statutory requirement because see we can't call it a contract right but still it is the statute the indian contract act is laying down that uh, uh, is uh, uh, incorporating such a provision and providing remedy in case of relations which are uh, obligations which are resembling those created by contract quasi contract is based more on principles of natural law such as moral conscience justice honesty duty towards another human being etc the main point of difference between contract and quasi contract is that in case of latter that is quasi contract there is no exchange of offer acceptance or consideration between two or more parties still it is legally enforceable so it's like similar to the point which we had just uh, discussed above so therein we said it is a statutory requirement because law is asking you to do that still it is legally enforceable it is legally enforceable because your right has been infringed even if no valid contract but right has been infringed the last thing is the remedy in quasi contract so section 73 like it provides damages in case of breach of contract provides similar remedy in case of quasi contract also which says when an obligation resembling those created by contract has been incurred and has not been discharged we are referring to quasi contracts here and this is part of section 73 only any person injured by the failure to discharge it is entitled to receive the same compensation from party in default if such person had contracted to discharge it and had broken his contract that means if you are not reimbursing if you are not repaying returning then that the other person the affected party has the right to approach the court and claim compensation rightfully thank you friends Hello, I am Shikha Dixit. I teach psychology, and I am with the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Kanpur. Uh, today, I am going to talk about what is health psychology. In the recent past, health psychology has emerged as one of the important areas in psychology. It is a field of study where psychological theories and concepts are applied to understand. issues regarding health and illness the two major themes which health psychologists are interested in studying are the themes of illness experience and behaviors associated with that experience uh, contemporary health psychology adopts various uh, and diverse kind of perspectives to understand health and illness issues these perspectives include the behavioral perspective the societal perspective and the cultural perspective if we uh, try to enumerate the kind of topics that health psychologists study <coughs> the range is very wide to name a few of the topics health psychologists study uh, cognitions related to illness that is health and illness related cognitions social cognitive aspects of health and illness cognitive adaptation uh, chronic illness and uh, adaptation to chronic illness disability stress and management of stress uh, cog- uh, health psychologists also study topics such as health related quality of life social support and various kinds of coping mechanisms that people adopt to deal with illness illness experience in addition to this kind of experience health psychologists also study uh, health health care systems health promotion and treatment related aspects including doctor patient relationships so as we see the range of topics is very large 
health psychologists also use uh, qualitative methods and they study uh, topics such as narratives of illness experience as well as social representations of health and illness. So, uh, we see that the range of these topics is very large. However, this is not an exhaustive list. More recently, some health psychologists have adopted a critical health psychology approach. These health psychologists are, uh, they offer a critique of mainly of the biomedical and behavioral uh, perspective of health and illness as well as the methods an approach which is used to understand health and illness. So, critical health psychologists focus on the social, cultural and political aspects of health issues. If you look at the methodological aspects, overall health psychologists adopt a quantitative methodology, they also use qualitative methodology and many health psychologists use uh, the mixed method approach.